Good afternoon, it's Debbie Evans here. No sign of Rolo, I think he's cooling off indoors. Today I'd like to read from The Secret Adventures of Rolo, book four, Jewel Dog and the Dragons. And this is the chapter about Rolo visiting the underworld. So a bit of Greek mythology going on. And I'm just going to start in, in the underworld. Guarding the door was the most terrifying dog I'd ever seen in my life. It looked a bit like the Roman dog Brutus I'd met in Pompeii, but this was much scarier as it had three heads. The creature seemed to be having an argument with itself. I edged a little nearer, grateful for my dragon's disguise, else I feared I would be devoured. I tried to pull myself up to full height, hoping to intimidate the snapping creature. Another one for the circus, snapped the dog head nearest me. You better come in, said another. This way then, said the third, hurry up and shut the door behind you. All three dog heads glared at me. They were slavering wildly as if they hadn't eaten for a week. I saw they were tethered to a post, three iron collars all forged together and one very heavy duty link chain keeping them there. Well, this seems to be going well. I hadn't met with any resistance and I didn't give them as a, a backward glance as I trotted on. A massive wooden door creaked open and fell my terrier shake over which I had little control, even though I was temporarily a dragon. There was a horrible stench of it, it needed emptying. To my surprise, amid all this gloom and decay, there sitting by an open fire was a beautiful young woman. She had long hair and wore flowing robes and sumptuous jewellery, and the table next to her was groaning under the weight of freshly prepared food. But clearly, she wasn't happy. The poor lady was sobbing as if her heart would break, and as I drew nearer, I could tell from her less than beautiful red and blotchy face she'd been crying for some time. I approached cautiously as I didn't want to scare her. She must have heard me. I wasn't very light on my dragon claws. Come here, sweet little dracon, in and what do you my husband sent you as a present to cheer me up? That's very kind of him. He is trying, though he doesn't have much of a clue. Her voice was soft and friendly. Arms and set scary after all. I forgot all about being a dragon and started licking away her tears. She smelt nice. Ooh, that that I my rival. Oh, Cerberus wouldn't stop you coming in. He's only there to stop anyone leaving. And with that, she started crying again. This was a bit awkward. When I'm a cute Jack Russell, I can usually cheer people up because I snuggle in. So I'm small. I'm sure this works when I'm a scary dragon. What's a pretty girl like you doing in that up line? My name is Persephone and I've been brought here against my will. Hades fell in love with me, so he kidnapped me, opened up the earth and I fell through the crack right in front of my mother's eyes. That's I would give anything to be able to leave. My mother, Demeter, is beside herself with worry. She is goddess of the harvest and has taken herself away from the earth to mourn my loss, which means there are no crops and everything on earth is barren. It's as if the world has come to an end. Hades will not give me up and my mother will not stop mourning. I just don't know what's going to happen. I seem to be causing a global disaster. Ooh, that sounds familiar, I thought, remembering Helen of Troy, and I tried to snuggle in to comfort her, but it wasn't really working. Instead, I sort of head-butted Persephone in the ribs. Dragons are not very cuddly, it seems. Suddenly, there came the sound of approaching hoofbeats and the clattering of wheels, and in front of my eyes, a chariot pulled by four shiny black horses came to a screeching halt right inside that large, gloomy hall. The draught they brought with them almost extinguished the fire. What have we here? A voice boomed down like thunder as a huge man alighted from the chariot, a dark and hairy Greek arm, and dangled in front of a bulbous nose for inspection. I didn't order a dracon, Hades roared. They've sent the wrong pet for you. He turned to Persephone and for a terrible moment I thought he was going to fling me into the fire. But he's cute, my love. Please let me keep him. The lovely lady rose and entreated her husband with big tear-filled eyes. 
After what seemed like an eternity, Hades handed me over to his wife with a grunt, and I breathed a sigh of relief, safe once more in her perfumed arms. Your mother's causing a bit of a problem on Earth, Hades said to Persephone. I hoped I wasn't going to witness a domestic argument. It seems she's gone on strike, and if I don't release you from the underworld, then mankind will starve, as she's not going to allow their crops to grow. I don't like being bullied by a woman and I don't know what all the fuss is about. Sort it out with you, will you? And with that, he leapt on his chariot and left the hall in a hurry. May I speak? I piped up. Persephone set me on a low table and bent down to listen more closely. Speak, little dracon, she sighed. Don't you like it here? Does he treat you badly? I asked. Well, I don't mind Hades himself. He has a softer side that nobody else sees. He's full of bluster to the outside world, but he can be kind in his own way. But I haven't been able to eat anything since I arrived here. I've completely lost my appetite. I don't want to be here all the time in this miserable place. It's like a dungeon, and I do miss my mother, she spoke softly. Well, why don't you strike a bargain? Stand up for yourself, I ventured. This seemed a novel idea in ancient Greece. Why not see if your husband will let you return to Earth for a certain time each year on the understanding that you will return to spend an agreed amount of time with him in his um, lovely kingdom? How does that sound? Clever little dracon, this is a marvellous solution. Now all I have to do is persuade him. And only if he lets me keep you as a pet, Persephone added, dabbing her beautiful eyes with a hanky. Oh no, that's not part of the bargain. How am I going to get out of this one? I think I shall call you Dekomai. I didn't have to wonder for very long what that meant. You are the seeing one. You see an answer to my problem. Persephone patted me on the head as if I were a little dog, and I must say she sounded a lot more cheerful than when I'd first entered the room. All of a sudden I feel hungry. The beautiful young woman pulled a platter of fresh fruit towards her. I remember Yulia's warning not to eat anything in the underworld, but I guessed it only applied to me. I watched spellbound as Persephone chose a pomegranate, tearing through the leathery skin and biting chunks of the fleshy fruit. Blood-coloured juice was running down her chin as she broke her sad fast, feasting on the bright red pips as if her life depended on it. Are you sure you won't have any? It's delicious, she said, holding a piece of dripping fruit out to me. I resisted. To be fair, if it had been steak, I might have been tempted. Suddenly, Hades himself appeared at the centre of the room. He had a helmet under his arm. I wondered how he did that. I certainly hadn't heard or seen him enter, and there was no sign of the chariot. He's always coming and going, she whispered in my ear. His helmet has magical properties. When worn, both it and the wearer become invisible. It's a bit creepy, to be honest. I wondered how much of our conversation he had heard. I think we have solved the problem, Persephone explained the plan. Hades listened to his beautiful wife and conceded, very well, you can spend eight months of the year with your mother and four months of the year down here with me in my realm. How does that sound? I don't want to make you unhappy, but I can't give you up entirely. Go at once to see your mother and persuade her to resume her duty of overseeing the crops and bring this drought to an end. Make sure you look after Dirk and I for me whilst I'm away, she said over her shoulder as she skipped out of the drafty hall. Now I had to manage my own escape. I quickly hatched a plan. It was just two of us, dragon and man. I asked Hades to tell me about life as a Greek god. As I had suspected, he loved talking about himself. There was no stopping him. Whilst he was telling me stories about Zeus, Poseidon, and life on Mount Olympus, and all the tricks they played on mankind, he drank deeply from a large silver goblet. I could tell he was getting sleepy, and before long he was snoring loudly with his head slumped on his folded arms across the table. I seized the moment, grabbed the helmet and pulled it over my head. It was so big I disappeared inside it, literally, for I had become invisible. I made for the exit and slipped unseen past Cerberus. The three-headed dog was still having an argument with itself. 
I caught up with Persephone by the jetty. She was having a hard time persuading Sharon to take her across the other side of the river. I've forgotten my purse, she wailed. I need to run this by the boss, said Sharon. My orders are nothing leaves this place. And the ferryman left her sitting in the ghostly boat whilst he went inside the palace to find Hades. I was still invisible under the helmet when I jumped on board the boat. I flung the helmet off and it fell with a clatter at Persephone's feet, giving her the fright of her life when I appeared beside her. If I were you, I would grab that stick and punt us over to the other side, I said, before that husband of yours changes his mind. Persephone didn't hesitate, picked up the pole and started pushing the boat out into the river. Sharon appeared, shaking his fist. And then the booming voice of Hades could be heard across the water. Farewell, my lovely. Your departure does not trouble me. I have found the remains of the pomegranate you ate, and so am assured of your return. Little had Persephone realised that by eating a few fruit pips, and thereby breaking her fast in the underworld, Hades had a hold on her forever. Poor Persephone, her destiny was sealed. Mental note to self never touch a pomegranate. I stayed around to watch the very moving reunion of mother and daughter on the opposite river bank. In front of my eyes I could see start seeds starting to germinate and green shoots pushing up through the bare earth. The drought was finally over, spring was on its way. I thought about Persephone having to return to the underworld and understood that this is why ancient Greeks believed that nature dies back in winter when Demeter is mourning the loss of her daughter, but that Hades keeps his pledge to let Persephone return to her mother every year, assured the fertile time of spring and the promise of a good harvest to come. I wondered for a fleeting moment how Sharon was going to get his ferry back. At least I'd left Hades' helmet on board, much as I knew the floppy-haired boy would enjoy testing its invisibility powers. I knew Athelstan wouldn't let me keep it, as it belongs in mythology and not modern day. Can you get the jewel collar off me, please? My wings are tired and I'm dying to scratch, I begged Yulia once I'd arrived back at the foot of the oak tree. Had enough dragon adventure for one night, little pup, smiled Athelstan. I couldn't wait to feel the tingling sensation as my dragon sails, scales turned back into fur and my scaly legs once more became paws. I'll take care of this then, said Yulia, as she climbed down <clears throat> inside the tree roots with the collar. So that's the end of the chapter for today and I'll be back again tomorrow at two o'clock and um, this video will be uploaded to YouTube. Just look for my name. Debbie Evans. Thank you for listening. Bye.